I had to describe GCF in one word, it would be caring. Authentic. Family. Community. GCF in one word, family. Fun. Belonging. Community. Home. Gracious. Resurrection. Family. GCF is the best family. GCF to me is home. In this series, we're talking about hearing God, hearing the voice of God and learning to do that. And uh, we're going to be looking this morning at John chapter 10, uh, a few verses between 1 and 18 in there. So if you have a Bible, you can find that there. Uh, uh, if you use the Version app, you can, as I say every Sunday, go to the events and find GCF Vineyard Community Church and they'll pull up uh, the specific verses from that chapter we're going to be looking at. So I want you to imagine that you're sitting in your favorite coffee shop or McDonald's or your favorite fast food joint, wherever it is that you may hang out sometimes to eat, drink a cup of coffee, do a little reading, thinking. And just imagine that you're, you're sitting there in that place and you've got your head turned down and your eyes are closed and someone comes up to you to interrupt you because they're worried about you and they ask if you're okay. And you, you say to them, oh, I'm fine. I was just talking to God. And they'll say, oh, well, we'll, we'll you know, get, I, sorry I interrupted your prayer. We'll let you get right back to that. And chances are, and you know this, that that person is probably not going to think about you during the course of the rest of the day. There's even the possibility that that person will walk away from you thinking they wish they could talk to God as easily you, as you were talking to God right there in the middle of the coffee shop or the restaurant. But let's change that up just a little bit. Imagine that you're sitting in the same place. You've got your head bowed and your eyes closed and some comes up to you and they interrupt you to ask if you're okay. They're a little worried about how you're looking. And instead of saying to them, I was just talking to God, you say to them, oh, I'm okay. God was just talking to me. Now, in all likelihood, they're going to look at you and very uncomfortably say, well, I'll just leave you to that. And you know that they're going to think about you a gazillion times through the rest of the day. And you know that every time they think about you, they're going to be wondering if a few nuts aren't about ready to fall off of your mental bolts because you were talking to God. Or God was talking to you. Lily Tomlin, who's a comedian, she's a little bit dated now, but a couple of TV shows on Netflix, I think. And Lily Tomlin, one of her stand-up routines, once asked, why is it that if I am talking to God, I am praying, but if God is talking to me, I'm schizophrenic? And it's a really good question because by and large, in our culture, and even amongst not just non-Christians, but even amongst many Christians, we are quite comfortable with the idea of talking to God, of praying, but we are decidedly often uncomfortable about the idea of God talking to us. And we are especially uncomfortable with people who say that God talks to them. And many of the Christians and, and many of the people who aren't Christians who are, are wary of people who say that God talks to them, they have good reason for being wary of that. I mean, we, we know that most of us can think of examples where we know people who have abused what they say is the voice of God to manipulate people. And I could not count on my fingers and my toes the number of cult leaders in my own 43-year lifetime who have claimed that they heard the voice of God and have then used, the, used what they say is the voice of God to manipulate other people and to brainwash them into horrible places and into doing horrible things, even taking their own lives or taking the lives of others. I remember when I was a child, there was a famous television preacher, his name was Oral Roberts, had a really booming ministry on television, until one day on his television program, he decided to say that God had told him that if he didn't raise X millions of dollars by X date, God was going to take his life. Turns out he didn't raise the money and God didn't take his life. And most people realized that when he said that, it wasn't that he had heard the voice of God. Most people understood that what he had heard was his own inner voice of greed. And so we can think of all of these examples, many examples of how people have said they hear the voice of God, but they've abused the voice of God to manipulate other people. And this leads many people to say, I just don't want to deal at all with the idea that God talks to anybody. As a matter of fact, there are Christian theologians and biblical scholars who have articulated whole theologies to basically explain why, according to them, God stopped talking individually and particularly to mankind when the last word of the New Testament was penned. Like when the dot was put at the end of Revelation, they would say God stopped talking individually and particularly to human beings. When I was in seminary, doing a class at a seminary in another state, and I want to be clear, it was not this seminary where my degree is from. It's from another seminary where I was doing classes. I was in this course where it was called Biblical Theology for Ministry, and I was in the Old Testament half of the class. And one of the assignments in the course was that we had to each present um, a case study or a scenario 
to everybody else in the class, and then everybody else in the class had to write, using biblical scholarship and biblical theology, how they would handle that issue within the life of the church. And so one of the students in the class, he was from up at Taylor University in Indiana, said that there was this woman at his church, it was obviously not a a charismatic church like the Vineyard is or like GCF is, he said there's this woman in the church who's always telling her community group, her small group, that she has words from God for them. So how would, you know, and the deal was everybody had to write a paper about how they would handle that. And I thought, this is a no-brainer. I'm from GCF. I mean, right, like we have a whole system for handling this. And so I wrote about how we handle those things at GCF. Now, I want to say this prof loved Jesus. He really loved Jesus. You see the fruits of that in his life. He was a kind and patient man. But I'll never forget getting my paper back from him after the class was over. You know, when a professor really wants to hurt you, they write in red ink and write large. And he'd written on my paper at the end, if God has spoken definitively to us in Scripture, why must he say more? Question mark. And if it hadn't been that I'd gotten an A in the class, I might have decided it was worth arguing with him about it. But I'd gotten my A and wasn't going to you know, take any risks at that point. But I always thought I would like to go to that professor and say, you because you value Scripture so highly, think that I somehow value Scripture less highly because I believe that God still speaks to His people. But what I want you to understand is that I believe that God still speaks to His people precisely because I value Scripture so highly. And Scripture is quite clear to me that God still continues, even today, to speak individually and particularly to his people. But for a guy like my professor, he'd seen so many people abuse that gift that for him, those of us who say we actually hear God speaking to us particularly and individually, we're just crazy. We might be a little schizophrenic, as Lily Tomlin said. And that's okay because that puts us in good company. Because there were a group of religious people who thought Jesus was crazy. And this group of religious people thought Jesus was crazy particularly because Jesus was always going around insisting that that God, his Father, was talking to him. And not only that, not only did Jesus say God, his Father, was talking to him, but Jesus insisted that a new day was about to dawn when God was going to talk to every human being individually and particularly in much the same way he believed that God was speaking to him individually and particularly. And this really miffed this one group of religious people who were called Pharisees because for centuries... For centuries, these these pharisaical religious leaders had believed that they were the arbiters and the dispensers of the voice of God to the people of God. God had said what he was going to say in the Hebrew Bible, in the Old Testament, and it was their job to tell people what God had said and to tell everybody how what God had said applies uniquely to their life and their circumstances. That was their job. And so they were scared to death when Jesus came along saying God was talking to him and God was showing him things that people needed to hear. They didn't like that. They felt threatened by Jesus. And so they accused Jesus. They thought Jesus was crazy. Jesus ended up in lots of confrontations with the Pharisees. And one of his most famous confrontations with them happened after Jesus had healed this man who was born blind. And so Jesus heals the man who was born blind. Some of the Pharisees find out about it. And they like set up this courtroom type setting. And they pull this guy who's just been healed. He'd been blind since the day he was born. They pull him into the little courtroom type setting. And they start to depose him. They they grill him. Ask him lots of questions because they suspect that Jesus has healed him. And they don't like Jesus, and they want to find out if Jesus healed him so they can see if they can find a way to get Jesus. And they grill the poor guy. Now, the fortunate thing is if you read the story in John 9, this guy gives back as good as he gets. So he's got to turn around for everything they say to him. And they finally get so frustrated with him that instead of being able to celebrate the fact that he has been healed, that he can now see and he's never been able to see, they toss him out on his ear and say, you're a sinner, we don't have to listen to you anyway. Jesus then finds the guy, finds out what has happened, And there are some Pharisees, apparently, who followed the guy and are hanging around. And Jesus, this is one of those moments when Jesus has had it up to here, and he can't have it up to here. It's like right here. And he's he's decided he's got to address this. And so he wants to explain some things to these Pharisees who've always depicted themselves as the leaders of God's people. And in order to explain some things through them, Jesus relies on a simple common image that everybody in the first century would have known. He's going to talk about shepherd and sheep. He does this quite often. It would be like today if I talked about a mechanic and a car or a boy and his dog, something common like that that we just sort of all understand and could understand basic lessons that we're wanting to come out of that. So Jesus talks to them about shepherd and sheep because he wants 
these religious leaders to understand quite clearly what a good leader of God's flock does and how a bad leader of God's people behaves. He wants them to see that very clearly. And so he starts out talking about shepherds and sheep, and here's what he says. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him. Now, this is probably a little bit lost on us because I, I... Probably very few of us in this room, if any, keep sheep. Maybe some of us have goats. My wife wants a miniature horse because we've got about two acres. I'm like, no, we're not having a miniature horse. I want a miniature horse. I want to know how to take care of miniatures. I don't want goats. I don't want sheep. Right? So we're this is a little lost on us. So we have to dig into this a little bit. What in the world is all this gate and gatekeeper stuff? Well, first century Israel was uh, an open range, like the United States would have been for much of the 1800s, so that if you had cattle... You just led them wherever you needed to take them to to find green pastures and water. It didn't really matter who owned the land. You just did that. And first century Israel would have been the same way if you were a shepherd. It was open range. You just took your sheep wherever you needed to take your sheep to find green pastures and still waters and all that Psalm 23 stuff, right, that shepherds want to lead their sheep to. And after they had done a day's worth of journey, sometimes they would not be near a pen, but sometimes they would be near these places, these sheep pens, that landowners often set up and would then charge a little bit of money so that the shepherds could put their sheep in that pen and then go away for the night, like have a break from their sheep. And so Jesus is talking about a scenario where shepherds have led their sheep around all day. They then bring their sheep to this pen. They maybe pay a little bit of money. Their sheep go into the pen, and the sheep is manned by a gatekeeper at the gate. So that when the shepherd comes again, there would have been several flocks in there, not just one shepherd. There may have been five, six, ten flocks all in this pen, depending on how large each flock was. When the shepherd would come back the following morning, he would go to the gate. The gatekeeper would be there. The gatekeeper would recognize the shepherd as one of the shepherds of the flock in the pen, and he would let the shepherd into the pen through the gate. And so Jesus says this to them, and the Pharisees are kind of like, well, yeah, what's the point? It's written all over their faces. Duh, we all know that. Why don't you tell us something we don't know? So Jesus does. And here's sort of a little bit later, here's how Jesus explains this whole thing about the gate. Jesus says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. Huh? But the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And this is one of those places in Scripture, guys, where Jesus sort of just blows the Mr. Rogers theory of Jesus out of the water. So he's not being nice and pastoral here. He's making a really hard point. So remember, the Pharisees believed that they were the gatekeepers. They were the ones who determined who was really in the people of God and who was not in the people of God, just like they had decided that the man who was healed, who was born blind, was not really in the people of God. They assumed that that was their job. They would determine who was in the flock and who wasn't in the flock. And they were saying Jesus wasn't in the flock along with the blind guy. And Jesus says, you guys have got that all wrong. It's like, if, if, if you ever were the gatekeepers to the flock, which is highly questionable, if you ever were the gatekeepers to the flock, let me just assure you that you are no longer. That's not who you are. Because I am now the gate. I, Jesus, determine who is in the people of God and who is not in the people of God. And that presents a real problem for the Pharisees because the Pharisees don't believe Jesus is the gate. And Jesus is basically saying to the Pharisees, I am the gate, which means if you want to even be in the flock of God, much less be leaders in the flock of God, you now have to come through me. In other words, what he's saying to the Pharisees is, guys... In order to be a part of the flock of God, and especially if you want to be leaders of God's flock, you have to say some things you've never been willing to say about me. So, for example, guys, you're going to have to stop saying I'm crazy. You know, I just walked off the the mental farm. You've got to stop that. You're actually going to have to start telling people I'm the sanest human being who's ever walked the face of the earth. You're going to have to start saying to people and saying to yourselves, I actually hear from God because I'm the son of God. And I am now the arbiter of what God is saying to humankind. If ever you were, you are no longer that. In other words, Jesus is saying, Pharisees, if you want into what God is doing, it's through me. 
And if you're not going to come in through me, which entails saying, I'm sane, I hear from God, you, you're, not, you're not in the flock, much less a shepherd of it. Much less a leader of it. It's a really, really harsh teaching. As a matter of fact, Jesus says, if you don't come through me to get into the flock of God and you try to come in another way, that just makes you a thief. Because who would come back to the pen and not go through the gatekeeper? It would be someone who wasn't the shepherd, a thief who was trying to sneak in and steal the sheep to just use the sheep for what he could get out of them. Jesus made a really hard point here about the gate. Now, as soon as Jesus finished talking about the gate, he then explains what happens when the shepherd enters into the gate. The shepherd has come to the gatekeeper. The shepherd then goes through the gate into the pen. Well, how in the world is the shepherd supposed to get his sheep out of the pen? There could be as many as ten flocks in there. Sheep look a lot alike. How in the world is that supposed to work? And Jesus says, this is, this is what happens in shepherding. Well, the shepherd gets in, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought all his own, out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. Again, we, most of us don't know anything about sheep, so we have to think a little bit more, learn a little bit about how this works. In the first century and even prior to the first century and in centuries after that, even in places today where you still find shepherds, shepherds will typically develop a little melody or tune that is unique to them for their flock. They will then sing that little melody or tune that is unique to their flock so much that their sheep learn the melody, the little tune, and they learn to tell that it is their shepherd who is singing the melody. So that another shepherd could come singing the melody and the sheep wouldn't follow that shepherd because not only do they have to recognize the melody, but they have to recognize the timbre or what you call the quality of the voice. Not just the content, but the quality of it. And so Jesus is saying, here's the deal. Shepherds sing to their sheep. And they don't just sing once. They sing continuously to their sheep. Shepherds are always talking to their sheep. As a matter of fact, that's how they lead their sheep. So they go into the pen, they start singing their song, or they start talking to their sheep, and the sheep that belong to them will come out and follow that shepherd just at the recognition of his voice. The voice is central here. The shepherd is always talking to the sheep to the point that the sheep always recognize the voice of the shepherd. And of course, those clueless Pharisees have no idea what Jesus is saying, so he's going to have to explain it to them again. So in explaining it to them, Jesus says this, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. Sheep look a lot alike. But when a shepherd went into a pen that was full of various flocks, the shepherd could tell the difference between the sheep that belonged to him and the sheep that didn't. He could look at sheep within his own flock and say, this is that sheep by that name, but that's that sheep by that name. So well he knew them. Down to their individual differences. And he was always singing and talking to them so that the shepherd not only knew his sheep, but the sheep came to know the shepherd. Because he was always talking to them. Always speaking to them. And Jesus points out a really harsh lesson. He says, I'm the good shepherd. I'm the good shepherd. But... Not you guys. So just think about sheep. Sheep will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. It's just like in so many words, Jesus is saying, do you Pharisees want to know why most of the people hate your guts? Seriously. Do you want to know why most of the people cannot stand to be around you? Why they're scared of you? It's because you treat them like you t- treated the blind man. That's not how a shepherd treats sheep. That's how a thief does it. That's how a hireling does it. That's how somebody treats the sheep who just wants to get out of the sheep what they can get out of the sheep and then turn them loose to their own ends whenever they're done with them. You guys are just hirelings. The sheep don't recognize your voice because you're never talking to them. You don't bother to know them. I'm the good shepherd because I know my sheep. I know the difference between them. I can look at this one and tell you that's Baba black sheep and I can look at that one and tell you that's woolly white. And, and I can look at those two who are both white and tell you why one of them is not the other one and has a different name. I know them that well. And they know me that well because I'm just always talking to them. 
Always singing to them. Always talking to them. Jesus says that's how the relationship between a shepherd and a sheep works. That's how his relationship with the people who are in his flock will work. He knows them and they know him because he's always singing, always talking. And then he, he, he says this right in the middle. This is astounding. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. Guys, that's just absolutely astounding. Jesus says the relationship that we have with Him is like the relationship that He has with God the Father. Now, a little bit earlier in John's account of Jesus' life, Jesus says this at one point, talking about His relationship with God the Father and Himself as the Son. The Son can do nothing by Himself. He can do only what He sees the Father doing. Because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. For the Father loves the Son and shows Him all. It's like Jesus is saying, God is always showing me things. God's always talking to me. And when God talks to me, I recognize His voice and I respond accordingly. And He's saying the same thing is true of the relationship I have with the sheep in my flock. Jesus in so many words is saying, listen Christians, if it's relatively easy for you to believe that Jesus had an intimate relationship with God the Father, that God was always speaking to Jesus, that Jesus always knew when God was speaking and responded accordingly, it ought to be just as easy for you to believe that Jesus is almost always speaking to you and that you can respond to what He has to say to you. It ought to be that easy if you believe that about Jesus. Jesus says you believe that about yourself in relationship with Him. That He talks to you and talks a lot. Because he wants to guide you in right paths and to the better places. And does steep sheep are pretty stupid guy. Doesn't want to leave you to your own ends. To get yourself into your own danger. As it works this way, Jesus has a voice and he uses it. Jesus did not shut up at the end of the New Testament era. God did not take Jesus' voice when the last period was put there at the end of the book of Revelation. Jesus has a voice, and He uses it. And guess what? We hear the voice, and we're not crazy. As a matter of fact, as the followers of Jesus, we recognize that if we don't hear the voice, we will go crazy. We recognize that the most sane thing on earth for us is hearing the voice of God through Jesus. It's hearing Jesus speak to us. Now, I don't usually ask you guys to do this because I think it's a little bit elementary school a bit first, second grade, but I'm going to do it this morning because I think this is so important. I think we, as so many of us as the followers of Jesus, are so uncomfortable with the idea that God might actually speak to us because we've seen it abused and misused so many times that we don't ever actually experience it, which is kind of sad to me. So I want you to turn to your neighbor, and you're going to say this. We're going to add a word that I left out here. I just want you to turn to one or two people around you. I want you to say, I can hear the voice... And I'm not crazy. Just go ahead, go ahead, go for that. <laughs> Some of you may need to say, I want to hear the voice even if I go crazy. Now, let me guarantee you, let me guarantee you that if you hear the voice, it does not mean that you are crazy. But if you start hearing the voice, you will end up in some crazy situations. See, if you hear the voice, you're not crazy. But if you start hearing the voice, you will end up in some crazy situations you never imagined yourself to be in. Sean Bowles is a pastor and ministry leader out in Southern California in the Los Angeles area. He's written a concise little book called Translating God about hearing the voice of God. Let me just say, Sean Bowles does not give himself the title prophet. But he's definitely gifted in what we would call the prophetic. Which means he's really attuned to hearing from the voice of, hearing the voice of God, particularly what God is saying for other people, and then really good at sharing what God is telling him with those people that it's for. I kind of like his humility in that. No, I'm not a prophet. God just talks to me. 
right? I kind of like that. Sean Bowles says that there was, um, he'd been to Australia to do some teaching. And he gets on the plane in Australia to come back to Los Angeles. It's a pretty long flight. And he sits next to this guy and he starts talking to the guy because lots of pastors will do that. Like most people hate to get on a plane next to a pastor. Uh Here comes the prying into everything about my life. Now me, I'm like, just leave me alone to read my book. But some pastors are like, you know, they want to talk a lot. So he gets on the plane next day, starts talking to this guy. The guy tells him he's an, in, in, an oil executive. He's in the oil business. Starts telling him some, a few things, just having some basic conversation. And the guy says, I've got to get up and go to the restroom. And the guy gets up to go to the restroom. And Bowles was just not necessarily prepared for this. But he's like, as soon as the guy got up to go to the bathroom, Jesus started downloading into me. He wasn't expecting this. He says, when he got up to go to the bathroom, that's when I heard the Holy Spirit speak. And this is what the Holy Spirit said. He hasn't told you the whole truth. He is not working for oil companies. He's the air marshal on this flight. I want to encourage him about his retirement, which is coming soon. I also heard a word of knowledge and got his wife's name, the place he always wanted to visit in Europe in his retirement, knowledge about his daughter who was pregnant with with several complications. And I love this about Sean Bowles. He then says, I was so overwhelmed and afraid I didn't want to share it when he got back to his seat. And he actually was debating about not sharing it. He said, except that as soon as the guy took his seat back, the guy said to him, so you were saying something earlier about working for God, working for a church? And Bowles is like, you know, when the Holy Spirit gives you that opportunity, like that's a, that's a level of such disobedience, right? He's like, I'm not going to do that. So he starts sharing with the guy what God has said to him, what the Holy Spirit said to him. And he says to the guy, how does that sound to you? And the guy says, that's true, but I'm not the air marshal. He says, well, well, what parts of it were especially true for you? He says, it was all true for me, except I'm not the air marshal. They continue to have some conversations. It's a long flight. They get into Los Angeles. They get separated, getting off of the plane. And Sean Bull says he's standing at the, the luggage claim area when he feels a hand put on his shoulder. And he turns around to see his friend he just met on the plane. And this is what the guy said to him. I can't believe God showed you I was the air marshal. I had to go and run a background check on you before I talked to you. It's amazing that God showed you all of that. I want to hear from God like that. You know, one of my hopes in this series is that we we come to the end of this in a few weeks. And I was not going to say 99.9%, but I just want to lump us all in. 100% of us are able to hear God that way. You know, Paul, those of you who don't know Paul, is the first great church planter in church history, wrote over half the New Testament. Pretty important figure. One of his letters to one of his churches, and this is a church where they're, they've got a lot of spiritual gifts going on, these special manifestations of the Holy Spirit to do ministry. And in this church, there's a group of people that are really caught up in the gift of speaking in tongues. And Paul is like, tongues are all well and good. But there's one gift above all others that I wish you would ask for. I wish you'd ask for the gift of prophecy. If you're going to desire any gift, if you're going to want any gift, would you want that one? You know, I can't tell you, and I'm all for people who speak in tongues. I'm glad for that. I told the Lord to give me that one, but he doesn't. I stopped asking for it because I realized at one point in time, Paul said, don't ask for that one, ask for prophecy. I asked for it and started getting it. What is this thing, prophecy, that Paul says we're supposed to desire? We're supposed to want above all the other gifts. Listen, there are hundreds of books written on this, and they will all parse out really fine definitions, trying to separate it all out for you, what it is and what it isn't. I just want to go with a simple way of thinking about it, because I think the Holy Spirit doesn't like to confuse us. Prophecy is hearing a word from God for another person and sharing that word with that person responsibly and lovingly. It's all it is. And so my hope when we get to the end of this series is that lots of you are experiencing that in ways that you never have, that you know God is speaking things to you, and when you know those things are for other people, that you know how to share them. I've always been amazed. I've been to so many gatherings where somebody up on the stage will say, if you want the gift of tongues, come forward to be pray, come up and we'll pray for you. I have never been in a gathering, charismatic, Pentecostal, or otherwise, where somebody said, if you want the gift of prophecy, come up and we'll ask for that. And yet that's the one Paul says you should ask for. 
Why? Because Paul says of all the gifts, there's one that is best for the church. It's prophecy. He says you can, you can go in a corner and speak in tongues, and unless there's somebody who knows what you're saying, that's just for you and the Lord. It doesn't help anybody. But if you, if you hear God telling you something for another person and you share that, that builds up the church. That encourages people. And here's the best thing yet. It makes guys like Sean Bowles' friend on the airplane all of a sudden become interested in this God who can read your mail and tell you things like that. All of that just to say one of my goals is that by the time we get to the end of this series, I hope a lot of us are hearing the Lord that way and know how to share it well. We're going to talk about that in a few weeks. But there's something that has to come first. And guys, I want to, I want to share this with you. This is deep pastoral concern for me. Because my suspicion is that a lot of us don't hear words from God for other people because we have never learned to actually hear Jesus speaking to us for us. And go so far as to say, not only are there too many Jesus followers in the world, there are probably too many Jesus followers in this room who cannot say Jesus has talked to me recently. And it's not because Jesus is not talking. It's because we've not taught you how to listen. How to hear. And so we have to become more basic. Prophecy is what it is. But the starting point is learning to hear Jesus talk to you for you. It's learning to hear Jesus speak to you about what you are to do and where you are to go and who you are in life so that He can lead you along right paths to the better places. And when we start to hear Jesus doing that for us individually, well, it's just like the doors will eventually blow wide open on hearing God speak for other people. So last Wednesday, I've had a really rough two or three weeks as a pastor. Just been a rough two or three weeks. I've lacked some energy and felt directionless, and it's just been a really rough patch for me. Last Wednesday, I'm having my prayer time in the morning, and I use a prayer guide in the morning. I put it together myself. It's prayers that other people have written, some from the common book of prayer. I read passages that are assigned for the day. And in the midst of that, I have a time where I'm not praying prayers of other people, but I talk about the things that I need in my life or that are needed in the you know the people, lives of the people I care about. And, and I come to that point in my prayer time, and I'm just pouring my heart out to the Lord, like, Lord, I don't know if I can go on much longer this way. I, I need you to talk. I need you to speak something to me. I, I need some encouragement. I need some direction. And then I drew quiet. And as soon as I drew quiet, I heard two words. And I didn't hear them here. We're going to see next week that God usually speaks through your thoughts and perceptions, and very rarely does He speak audibly to people. He gave me two words. How did I know they were words from Jesus? Two reasons. Number one, I've spent the last six to seven years of my life desperately learning or desiring desperately to learn how to hear Jesus' voice and tell it apart from the others. And because of that, secondly, I've come to realize that when Jesus talks to you, you will not doubt that it's Him doing it. He will talk with such a quality and such a content that is recognizable only as the voice of Jesus. And he gave me two words that were just for me. I'm not telling you what they were because they were just for me and him. And they were unique to me. They were particular to me for what I was going through. And that began a turn out of the two or three weeks that had been difficult for me. And guys, I just want to tell you, I heard Jesus speak and I don't think I'm crazy. I really don't. I think I would have gone crazy if he hadn't spoken. If I hadn't heard him. I heard his voice. I'm not crazy. And because I heard his voice, he led me in right paths to better places. And guys, you, you can hear the voice of Jesus. And it won't mean you're crazy. Or as I like to say, it, it, it at least won't mean you're any crazier than Jesus, and that's good company. You can hear the voice, and you're not 
nuts. You're not crazy. So I want to make just a, a, a couple of couple of suggestions, things for you to think about doing this week. And the first was really for everybody, but especially for those of you that you've been Christians for a long time and following Jesus for a long time, and you're like, I don't know that I've ever really heard Jesus talk to me. And I think this little simple thing will start opening some doors for you. I want you every day this week, Monday through Saturday, I want you to find 10 quiet minutes, maybe 15 quiet minutes. And you start out that 10 or 15 minutes by reading 10, 1 through 18. And then you say, Jesus, let me hear your voice. And then you just be quiet for the rest of that time. And you're not waiting for Jesus to speak to your ear. He's probably not going to do that. If he does, you're not crazy. But he's probably not going to do that. You then in that quiet period need to start paying attention to what is going on in your thoughts. What are you perceiving? And start asking yourself, what if my thoughts and perceptions is of Jesus, might be of Jesus, and which would not be of Jesus? You start to learn to hear him and to distinguish what is of him and what is not of him. The more you do that, the more clearly you come to hear Him and the more confident you become in knowing that it's Him when He's talking. Now, why do I stress quiet time? This is just, you know, some of you are like, because preachers are always talking about quiet time. This is a simple fact. When Kira, my wife, is talking to me and I'm looking elsewhere in the room, that frustrates her. She wants me to look at her. And I can honestly say when I'm talking to her, she doesn't look away like I do, but when she, when she does, I want her to look at me. You won't hear from God if you don't get quiet and listen. Jesus is a gentleman. He won't scream in your ear. He won't smack you up beside the face. But if you get quiet and say, I want to hear, he'll talk. And you'll start to learn when he is and when he's not. The second thing is this. In the back, and this will be here for each week in this series, there's a table back there with index cards and it says, what are you hearing from God? And I think this is so important for us as we think about this. We have got to get over the notion that the only people who hear from God in the life of the church are pastors. It's got to get over that. Some of you hear from God better than I do. And so that's back there, because what I want to encourage you to do, either when you come in because it's something you've heard from the Lord during the week, or as you leave because it's something you've heard during worship, you just write it down on an index card back there and leave it on the table so that it can be an encouragement to others that there are lots of people here who can hear from Jesus. And here's what may happen. It may not just encourage them that anybody can really hear from Jesus. It may actually be something unbeknownst to you that the Lord has spoken to you that's for the person who's going to see it back there. See how that works? I just want to encourage you each week as you're coming in or going out in this, just write down what you think the Lord is saying to you. We'll get those posted in the back. Final thing is this. Some of you here, and I, just hang with me for just a minute. It's going to be a little long here, but some of you have been Christians for a long time, but you haven't been followers of Jesus. Some of you call yourself Christian because mommy and daddy told you you were one or you know grandma and grandpa were one. So if somebody asked you, you would say, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. But you know good and well that there's not been anything in your life that's been about following Jesus. Letting Him lead you, letting Him guide you. And you probably know that because you can look at your own life and see what a poor leader you've been for yourself. And maybe all of this talk about Jesus being able to speak to folks this morning has been peaking in you the desire to have Jesus speak to you so that he can get you out of some of the messes you've made because you can't get yourself out of them. Maybe you're just realizing, I need a shepherd that I can follow. I need a shepherd who will talk to me that I can follow. Well, I've got your guy. His name's Jesus. And so some of you aren't hearing from Jesus, but you've been calling yourself a Christian for a long time. It may literally be because Christian's just been a cultural title for you. But it's not been at all about being committed to Him. Giving yourself to Him. So there'll be prayer ministers up here momentarily. If you come up and say, 
I want to give it to him today. I need his voice to get me out of the messes I'm in. They will know exactly how to lead you in praying. You'll start hearing him. And he will get you out of the messes you've made. If you listen. So I'm going to pray, and then we'll stand and worship.